Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Joining me is former George Bush press secretary and a whole lot of other stuff. We'll get to all of your right. credits in just a moment, but also a good friend of Barbara Bush's. And we're taking this moment today to invite you to join us and share your thoughts and comments down below as we talk about the life and legacy of the former First Lady, Barbara Bush. Um, kind of a shocker to the whole world at large, but we kind of had an idea this was coming, correct? Ernie, it's kind of hard for me to imagine a world without Barbara Bush. And I guess I, I, guess I, I will paraphrase what the noted American novelist John O'Hara said at the time that George Gershwin, the great American composer, died. And he said, you know, you're telling me that, that George Gershwin has passed, but I don't have to believe it if I don't want to. And yeah. that's kind of the way I feel about Barbara Bush. I just... I just can't imagine the world without her. They talk about the Bush program of, uh, of you know, lights, of the points of points light. light yeah. She was, in my view, a point of light for this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody was saying to me that the Bush presidency was one of the last times where we had a president that it didn't, it didn't matter what your political affiliation was, you would turn and say, that's my president. And that since then, we've kind of gotten so partisan that we've lost that, and that that's why she's such a symbol to us, too, of a first lady that everyone kind of got behind, because we all realized the significance of the position. I think that's absolutely correct. I, I, and the Bushes, and certainly Barbara Bush, uh, and I will say, I think one of her legacies was that she cared, the two words, she cared. She mm -hmm. cared about people from all walks of life, underline all walks of life. And hopefully that was helpful in bringing the country together in, in her way and, uh, you know, overriding of the political aspect of life that we know is so prevalent today. How, uh, we hear very little information about the health of the family. How long did we know this was coming? How eminent was it? Well, uh, look, you've got two people who are 92 and 93 years old. Yeah. That's a pretty full life. We should all be so fortunate. Uh, and, and what I highly respect about her, her was she did it on her own terms. It was yeah. vintage Barbara Bush. I'm going home to be with my family. Yeah. Uh, so you just have, I do certainly have to admire the way she, she handled herself with grace and dignity. Stories I hear is up until even the day that she passed, she was calling people. She was answering. I heard she was answering the phone at the house <laughs> with all this energy to say, "These reports you hear that I'm dead are not true." Is that true? <laughs> well, I'll let others speak to that, but <laughs> but uh, and that sounds like vintage Barbara Bush. Yeah. What uh, made her so unique to you? That she was unique. Yeah. Um, I, I think the answer for me to that question, though, is. And she called her. She wrote, signed a photo to me as her number two ma. She was like my second mother. I've, I've been blessed in life, Ernie. I had two mothers. One was named Dewey Roussel and the other was Barbara Bush. Yeah. And I think the reason I was absorbed into their family, that they kindly absorbed me into their family, was because they were so much like my family. And I always felt so comfortable being with them. And my mother, in fact, once wrote George Bush a letter and said, Peter thinks he's a Bush. <laughs> And, and I guess I did. There are worse things you could be, right? Well, that's right, yeah. I saw a, uh, an interview with Condoleezza Rice where she was saying that she went and stayed at Kenny Bunkport, their home out in Maine, and that Barbara Bush was like, you know, welcome, thank you for coming, and just remember, we make our own beds here. <laughs> and she was like, yes, ma'am, <laughs> got it. You want a good Maine story that yeah. nobody, very few people have heard about Barbara Bush? In 1976, it was the end of the summer, and they would usually stay to about Labor Day and then go back to Washington or New York or wherever they were working at the time. Well, that summer, that's when he was CIA director. And he'd gone back to Washington. And he wasn't real happy because he hadn't caught any bluefish that summer. And, of course, we know George Bush is a big fisherman, and he didn't like it when he didn't catch any bluefish. So it was the last day. I'm helping her, Neil Bush, one of their sons, and myself are helping her pack up the house. And uh, early in the morning, she said, all right, boys, go out and catch some bluefish. Well, I said, Barry, nobody's caught any all summer. Also, it was a horrible day. It was raining, miserable, yeah. cold. I said, there's no fish out there today. She said, I don't want to hear it. You boys go out there and don't come back till you have some bluefish. So I said, okay. So Neil and I go get in the boat, and we go out and just sit out there, you know, for an hour. Just as we're getting ready to pull anchor, these waves start rolling in, and you can see all these bluefish. 
you know, <laughs> we cast our rods out there, and within five minutes, we'd caught three huge bluefish. Now, mind you, this isn't a fish story. We couldn't <laughs> wait to get back to the house. Yeah. We ran back there. She, she was in the kitchen working at the sink, okay? I get to the door. She's got her back to where I am. I, I went, oh, bar. And I held up this bluefish, oh, bar. And she turned around. She didn't miss a beat. She goes, okay, boys, what grocery store did you buy them in? <laughs> <laughs> How was George about you guys catching the fish and him not catching them? He, later, in later years, uh, President Bush would send me a photo of him catch, with some big fish, and he'd say, <laughs> say, compare this to the minnows that you and Neil caught. <laughs> we want to remind you, too, as we're chatting here, because we're on Facebook Live, it's your opportunity also to share your stories, your thoughts, and comments about the life and legacy of Mrs. Bush. So please jump in and join us. And Aurora Lasada is here with us, and she's taking your questions for us, and I think she, her hand was raised. So... For what do you Peter, have? What's your favorite memory with Mrs. Bush? Oh, that'll be hard. That favorite is, memory. Yeah, and I get asked that about various people with whom I've worked, the Reagans, the Bushes. That question is always like you Ernie, in your career. Name the most notable moment in your career. It's, right. it's hard to say one because there's so many. Um, all the moments that I was with Barbara Bush where her sense of humor came into play, just as I the last story I told indicates yeah. are special moments. Um, there were just many, many, uh, I mean, many times, and it shows you how caring the bushes were of other people. Now, I can only cite the ones specific to me, but there would like would be Christmases where they'd call up and say, look, you're going to be alone at Christmas. Come on over. You know, we need you over here. Uh, when both my mother and father passed away, they were the first ones to call me and, you know, Come be with us. You need to be in Maine with us. You know, shouldn't be alone right now. Just those kinds of things of caring were all special moments. And, and needless to say, they've done it for many, many, many other people. But I guess because I felt a part of their family and they were so kind to consider me yeah. family that they were always thinking, what, what can we do for Pete? I'll tell you one moment that happened right here in Houston that's, that kind of sticks out, out in my memory, and you might say, well, that's no big thing, but it, it is stuck in my memory. It was right after they left the presidency, and they came here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been asked the last few days, by the way, well, why, did they, why did they come to Houston? They could have gone anywhere. I said, this was their home. Yeah. This is where their friends were. This is the city they love. Why not be back here? But anyway, I might have been the first night or the second night back here. Um, she, they called me up and said, uh, hey, we're going to the theater. We're going to see a touch show. They're doing Brigadoon. Do, do you want to come with us? I said, sure. It's always been one of my favorite shows. My sister played in it, actually, <laughs> here in Houston. So we went the next night to the theater. And the reason they wanted to go to that especially was because Brigadoon had come out on Broadway around the time they got married. And it had a special meaning for them. Yeah. And, it was, that, and that night was just kind of special. I thought, here they are. They're back in Houston. They're regular. They want to be regular citizens again. And I just thought the whole thing was, it was so, it spoke volumes about them as people. Yeah. And I've always tried to describe, the way I've always described the Bushes is, are they big shots? Yes. Do they act like big shots? Heck no. <laughs> well, in a world where so many manufactured moments happen today and things are planned, what you saw from them was genuine and real. Is I'll, tell you, fair I'll tell you how genuine. That, that caller just wanted to know what another moment that stands out for me. Okay, during, this would probably be in the 1990s sometime. One day I was at an event over in the Galleria. I guess it was an event where she spoke, where Barbara Bush spoke. When it was over, people were leaving, and she came up to me and said, I, somebody had driven her there, and she said, you know, I don't have a car. Would you mind driving me home? I said, sure, Bar. I said, and then this was kind of near summer, and I said, but I have to tell you one thing. I said, today I'm driving my 1966 Mustang, which has no air conditioning. And she looked at me as if to say, so? Yeah. Like that. And next I'm thing, riding. we're off and running, riding, riding home in my 66 Mustang without air conditioning. Now, if that isn't down to earth, I don't know what is. <laughs> that, was, me, that was vintage Barbara Bush. Talk to me a little bit about how you first came to work with George Bush and into the family. Uh, I, was, I was recently, in 1969, I hadn't been out of college that long. Um, and I'd worked in a couple of campaigns in Texas. 
uh, by various sets of circumstances I won't bore anybody with right now. But And I'd met him just to say hello, kind of in passing, hey, how are you, how did your campaign do, and, you know, that kind of thing. And then one day in 1969, uh, I was in Austin uh, doing, uh, serving as a press secretary for about seven or eight Republicans that were then in the state legislature. And the phone rang one day and this voice said, hey, Pete, this is Congressman George Bush. He said, why don't you come take a walk with me over to the Capitol? I've got to do a press conference. I'm here to do a speech. So we walked right across the front lawn of the Capitol. Little did he realize one of his sons would be governor in that Capitol about 25 years later. But uh, And he said, uh, I need a press secretary. He said, no, I've, I've checked you out and you get good marks. And Are you interested? And I, th I, th I would have said, hey, I'll pay you to let me do that job. And the end of it, Ernie, was we, so we visited, and I said, sure. Uh, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, tonight my friend Jimmy Allison is with me. That was a friend of his that he'd known in Midland and was kind of his Jim Baker of that period. And uh, he said, get with Jimmy and work out the details tonight. So we went to dinner, and it all worked out, and we're leaving. He's going off his way, and I'm going off my way. And Jim, mind you, this is Bush is just a second-term congressman at this point. Jimmy yelled after me, hey, Pete, one other thing. And I said, what? He said, stick with George. Someday he's going to be president. <laughs> and now, he now was that, right. Now, there's a guy in 1969 predicting that. Yeah. Uh, sadly, Jimmy Allison didn't live to see his prophecy fulfilled, but I got a hunch he knows. Yeah. We have another question coming in. Aurora's got uh, something for us. two. Two. Actually. Okay, Aurora. So, what, this is for Peter. What was the most difficult situation that you saw her dealing with? And this, the other one from Maggie is for both Peter and Ernie. There's been many anecdotes about Barbara Bush's sharp wit. What's yours? <laughs> That's a good one for you, Ernie. Yeah. I, I just told a couple of mine. Um, the most difficult moment, was that the question? Yeah, the that you question? saw her dealing with. Well, I can tell you one difficult moment but that myself and she and her husband had to deal with once once upon a time, uh, which virtually nobody knows about, which I guess I'll write about in my memoir. Uh, this would have been 1973 or 4 when he was chairman of the Republican National Committee. And we went to a, um, there was a conference at Mackinac Island, Michigan, which is this little island not far from Detroit, but it's, mm -hmm. it, there are no cars on the island. There's a big hotel, and a lot of companies have retreats there and that kind of thing. Well, we'd been to this conference. We were through. It's about 15-minute flight in a little plane back to Detroit, so where we were going to catch our flight back to Washington. So we go out there, and, you know, it's one of these little air strips where there's an air sock, and that's about it. We get in this little plane. They were, the two of them behind me, and I was sitting with the pilot. We were all pretty, you know, sandwiched in there. And uh, the guy that was the pilot said, okay, everybody fine, we're fine. He takes off. As soon as he took off, I noticed that the door on my side of the plane wasn't fully closed. And you could see a, a little bit, about six inches there where it yeah. needed to be closed. Well, I, I, you know, told the guy, the pilot, I said, look, we need to go back and close that door. He said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, we're not, it'll, take us longer to do that than to get to Detroit. And I thought to myself, easy for you to say, man, you're not sitting next to this door. So uh, as we climbed and the pressure became a little, I was, I was sitting there watching this thing. It's gradually climbing up that door. And I turned around to, to the bushes and, and they kind of leaned over and saw it and kind of shook their heads. Well, we kept climbing. Finally, we leveled off probably about 3,000 feet. And there's nothing under us but one of the Great Lakes. I don't know which one it was, but yeah. you're looking at nothing but water down there. And I mean, after about five minutes, all of, I'm watching that thing. It's gradually creeping up there. And, and I kept doing, you know, grabbing the pile. And he said, oh, don't worry. We're, we're starting to descend. All of a sudden, pow, that door flew open. And the plane kind of lurched and groaned, you know, and I went, whoa. And I'm, I'm, I'm just leaning this over like this, and I'm looking down at that water. And uh, President Bush leaned, or he said, we got to get that door closed. He said, that thing can come off the hinges and go right into the propeller. And, right. And, uh, boy, I mean, serious moment, very serious. And but but it was so the pressure was so great it was I it, plus I was worried about falling out of the plane right. and we're reaching over trying to pull that door closed and it was like pulling concrete. Well, he he his 
piloting skills were helpful from the war, President Bush. So he leans over to the pilot and he put his hand on the throttle and he said, we need to slow this down as slow as possible to create less wind resistance. So they pulled back the throttle. It felt like we were just sitting still in the air. And he leaned over me and the two of us, I don't know how we ever got that door closed, but after we, we pulled for about almost, I don't know, seven or eight minutes and finally got that thing closed. And I, said, I remember I was just sitting there, I thought, wow. Yeah. Well, when we landed, we got out and Barbara Bush looked at me and said, Pete, you, you, you look really, you look like a ghost. I said, <laughs> yeah, and for good reason, Bar. Now, there was a case that was, I think you could almost call that a life and death situation. But what I was impressed with about the Bushes is how they stayed calm during that and mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, immediately said, here's what we need to do. And me, I was, you know, I was rattled, wow. needless to say. But, and I don't know if that answers the woman's question or not. But, uh, but it gave us a story nobody else knows. There was true. another one that we'll get to in a second, but Aurora is jumping in. To Pete's, uh, Peter's uh, point, it probably does because another person, Carla, is saying, oh, great story. Carla, thank you for, <laughs> thank you, for listening and sharing this. It's I'll a true you, story. I'll tell you a fun thing about Barbara. She would, she would write me these handwritten notes. And uh, we would kind of, and it was always interesting to me because. Which is such a lost art. Nobody yes. Did, because of email. And they would just Nobody do it. Does that you know, anymore. they were so good at that. And, and it personal. made you feel, right, so important to them. I keep thinking how many people feel like they're close personal friends with them. And everyone I meet that met them feels the same way. But um, we had gotten to a point where we were what sending. What are their legacies, both of them, yeah. are all those, those handwritten notes. notes. Yeah. I had, we had been corresponding about something and she wrote me back a note. And it was the note cards that W had made that had the paintings of her dogs on the cover mm -hmm. of them. And so inside is the note written. I shouldn't be telling this story, but I will because it's too sure. cute. Why not? When you close it, look on the back. It says, you know, artwork, George W. Bush. And she had handwritten above it, my dogs look much better than these <laughs> dogs. And it was just like so cute and unexpected. But that's what I liked about her. Her wit was there. It's who she was. And she didn't. And I think whenever... And correct me if I'm wrong on this, in the moments throughout her career where maybe she was misunderstood or taken out of context, it was because people didn't understand her sense of humor and that her heart was always there and big, but sometimes people would misunderstand a quip or something like that that you wouldn't get if it's isolated from the situation. Uh, you're right, Ernie. It was a very, in many cases, a very clever, spontaneous wit. Very funny. And you can't, you, you'd almost do a double take sometimes. Wait a minute, what did she just say? Okay, I, so I'll tell, let me just tell you one more on that, and w which helped to far form my first impression of hers was that one of the first days I went to work for him, mm -hmm. which is in 1969. And in those days, he was a congressman, and he kept his boat out on the Potomac. It wasn't in Maine; it was there in, in Washington. It was a different kind of boat too than he later had. So one day, and I, she had called me on the phone when I got there and said, "Welcome, and we're so glad you're here." In those days, a lot of people don't realize this. She was a writer, too. Um, aside from books, she, in those days, wrote a column for the his 7th Congressional District that went to the weekly newspapers that were existed at that time in his Congressional District. I and it was that. I think it was called Barbara Bush's View on Washington. And it had I thought it had a very clever format. What it was about was the lesser known sites in Washington that if you come to Washington, you might want to take a look at, at this. Yeah, the monuments and all that's fine, but did Here's you the know other that? Stuff. Yeah. Right. So, I, so I, and I thought that was a very original idea. So I get out on the boat there that day and said, hello, Mrs. Bush. I'm honored, Mrs. Bush, to be part of this and so forth. And I, re I really like the idea, of Mrs. Bush, behind your columns. Now I'm going on like that. All of a sudden she went, stop. Just like that. I know where this is going. Stop. <laughs> Deary, and Deary was a term of endearment she used to say to people. She said, Dear me, Deary, call me Bar. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Here I am, a 20 something kid, wet, not even <laughs> dry behind the ears. And this congressman's wife is asking me to call her Bar. I was pretty impressed by that. Yeah. And you know something? I did just what she suggested for the next. 48 years. See, I never felt comfortable saying it to her. It was always Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Bush. But I just felt that there had to be that sense of, of uh, respect. Yeah. And you could see that wasn't what she wanted. She wanted to be 
with everyone else. She didn't want to be separate from everyone else. And, and that's just the way they tried to, have tried to conduct themselves ever since they came back from the presidency. Yeah. They just wanted to be regular folks in Houston again. Now, as we all know, there's certain things that you just got to deal with, such as security and those kinds of issues. But, they, you know, she was going to the supermarket and, and doing all the things the rest of us do. A friend of mine was a manager of the Rice Epicurean near where they lived and they would come grocery shopping. The Secret Service would stand at either end of the aisle and then they would just walk the aisle and do their shopping like but and they didn't want that they didn't want to be surrounded or kept no away trappings. or have yeah they just non big shot big shots. But on the flip side of that, we talk about them being everyday and average people. If if the numbers are right that I have recently heard in their time since the White House here in Houston, between the two of them, they've raised over a billion dollars for charities, which is just yeah. phenomenal when you think about it, through the work the two of them have done. Think about this, too. They could have come back here and had a nice, quiet life and gone about doing things that just for them, and they did just the opposite. Yeah. They were, from day one since they came back here, they've been involved in just what you're citing helping a variety of charities, raising money for causes and things that were dear to their hearts. It wasn't yeah. some cosmetic thing. And of course, her, her dedication to literacy is well documented. So when I say she cared, let me add another word. She truly cared. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the legacy is there. And I, I just admire them so much for having done that. They, you know, for all, they were always, and if they weren't raising money or going to some charity event, they were at an Astros game or a Texans <laughs> game or a Rockets game. They, they wanted to be part of Houston. They were definitely part of the community. We're talking with Peter Russell, who knew the Bush family very well, and uh, taking your questions, comments, thoughts about Mrs. Bush and her legacy as we chat. Um, to, to change this up just a little bit and to look at Mrs. Bush as what she contributed, because oftentimes in her life you see the men who have done. But here's a woman who was married to someone who became president, was the mother to someone who became president. There's a common link there, and it's Barbara Bush. Her influence, her, her strength, maybe her support, what do you think it was that she contributed that allowed these two men in her life both to, raise to this, rise to this position? Well, let me add one, let me extend your, your comment one step further. She once told me, and this would have been, frankly, I can't remember when, I would think probably maybe when they first came back here, she told me that over the years, with all their career changes, she had moved them over, over 30 times. <laughs> now, that. can you imagine moving a family around the world yeah. over 30 times? I, it's hard for me to move by myself one time <laughs> and with to five me, children and well that's my point yeah an entire family of five children a husband moving them and and to me you just have to be terribly anchored as a person mm -hmm. not to mention well organized um to do that and i think again that says a lot about the kind of person she was and that's that's a task that many of us face at one time or another which I've always dreaded because right. I think, oh, I got to pack up and <laughs> what, I'm going to leave something behind. And then I would think of her and, and over 30 times doing that. And I thought that just takes a special person to, to bring that off. I had heard a story that when they were leaving the White House that she had a set of stickers. And it was one sticker meant it was going to Houston. Another sticker meant it was going to Kenny Bunkport. And she put little stickers on everything throughout the house so that everything would be organized and go to the right place so she knew where everything was. I'm sure that's true. See how organized she was? I, I can't even begin to be that organized. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the way she was. Yeah. So as we continue to chat, once again, encouraging you to join in and be part of this conversation. Did you encounter the Bushes at some point and uh, meet Mrs. Bush? Or have you ever wondered or just want to say something about her at this, this important moment? You're going to be going to the funeral tomorrow. Yes. She had wanted to keep it low-key. <laughs> that low that key would mean keeping think. with Barbara Bush, and then she'd want everybody to get on with their lives. Yeah. And so what are you expecting for I had an event tomorrow? last night uh, up, in, uh, up in Huntsville that... And I thought, well, it, you know, maybe we should just cancel this. And then I heard her voice. Yeah. She was saying, no, no, Pete, you know better than that. They're expecting you to be there, and, and those students are expecting it. And Yeah, here in Houston last uh, night, the celebration of reading for the Barbara Bush Literacy she'd, Foundation. She'd be the first on. one to say, get on with it. You, you do the job. And, yeah. And I see Aurora making her way back to us, so I think we got a comment or question. Question for Peter. 
Do you think that she had an influence on her sons as they developed their political careers, and if so, how? Uh, the simple answer would be yes, I do. Um, and I, I saw it, to me, it goes way back in the raising of those children. Because, I, again, I don't know if we were saying this on camera here or not. Uh, I, I, you know, and all, that, all those children, I knew them from fairly young ages until they grew up. And I saw how she raised them and, and the values that she would instill in them. You know, uh, discipline, self-discipline. You know, it's time to get up. Mm -hmm. uh, be nice to people. Be kind to people. Say yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And I'd sit there and think, wait a minute, I, this is just like my mother <laughs> used to do. So I think by instilling those kinds of values in those children, they became successful, whatever each one did in life. And I know this, George H.W. Bush, <laughs> I mean, even when he was in the presidency, he'd meet somebody and say, yes, sir, to them. <laughs> and here he was, the president. president. <laughs> so I think the questioners... Uh, what they're asking is a good question, and I think what influence she did have on them, it started way back before they, them, the children, were involved in the political arena. But, and I know for me in my life, that's I, to this day, I hear my mother and father's voice yeah. when I'll start to do something, and they'll say, "You know better than that." And, and so, so that's how I think she was had had such an influence on her on her children. Aurora's back with another. Tons of questions for you. Wait a minute, whatever happened? Where are, where are the questions where, where, for where me? The, did Ernie ever answer <laughs> that one that he was supposed to? <laughs> oh, he did. he did. I did. I had my note card question. Okay, the first one is, Barbara Bush had a great love story. Can you tell me about the relationship Mrs. Bush and her husband had? Yeah. Uh, I would sum it up this way. It was like two teenagers. Yep. Even up till now, You'd see them walking along hand in hand, mm -hmm. joking, whispering in each other's ears, just like teenagers. So having observed it and knowing them, what do you think was the magic that made that relationship last for, what are we talking about, 72 years or something? Uh, Ernie, I'd say several things. Just an intangible chemistry was there, no, que mm -hmm. no question about it. They were just made to be with each other. And I guess there's people like that in life. Uh, there was a great trust factor there. They totally trusted each other. They listened to each other. I can't tell you how many times I'd say, be with him, and he'd say, well, Barr thinks, or Barr says. So that told me they were truly a team. Yeah. Uh, and as I've learned from all my years in the political arena, guess who, has the, guess who whispers in the ear of the candidate at the end of the day? Right. <laughs> it's not any of us aides. No. It's the wife. Uh, I just think they, they believed in each other, trusted each other, and it was just, I can't, I have to keep coming back. It was, it was rooted in those, those aspects and also in their just, I call it like being two teenagers. Yeah. And how, it, it just stuck. How do you think the president is going to deal with this? He'll, he'll, he'll get through. Uh, he's already kind of suggested, everybody, yes, it's a world without bar now, but Let's get going here. Yeah. Don't, don't you know, let's, she would want that. Right. Uh, I, somebody told me that Jeb was on a show yesterday, maybe, and saying, no, my mother, I start, you know, I didn't think about canceling because she would have she right. wanted me to be here. There, I don't know if I mentioned this already. Their event last night, the celebration of reading at the Hobby Center here in Houston, went on as scheduled because she wanted it to go on as scheduled. Absolutely. Yeah. There you are. You know, but talking about the, the romance and their love affair and all that, too. Do you know this? Uh, one time uh, I was at an Astros game here with them. And we were sitting there watching the game. And I looked over at one point, and she had the, the, the baseball scorecard, which is the same <laughs> scorecard that the official scorer of the game uses. And she was keeping the box score. And I can't do this. Most people can't, other than baseball people, with the exact symbols because you, you do the official <laughs> scorecard with certain symbols, like K is a strikeout, right. and you draw a little uh, rectangle for certain plays, and all the, you have to learn all that. She was keeping it just like an official score. I said, Barr, what are you doing? She said, I'm keeping the, the box score here. And I said, I looked at it, and I said, do you know that's exactly the way the official score does? She said, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> she had learned to do that when he was on the, the captain of the Yale baseball team, and she'd go to the games. 
it, it was the way she occupied herself. Yeah, I heard that she also kept. Oh, uh, Aurora's coming back. I'll let Aurora's question yeah, come I in first, you. then me. She's got a lot of questions. Okay, another one. What will Barbara Bush be remembered for 20 years from now? What will Barbara Bush be? I, I'm repeating it in case you're not miked, but what will Barbara Bush be remembered for 20 is, years? This is for both of you, not mm. just for Peter. Yeah. Well, do you you start off, Ernie? I've been doing all the talking here. That's that's a hard one. I think. Uh, there is a picture that's running through the slideshow behind us that I think is kind of fascinating. It's a picture of Barbara Bush with the first ladies when she was first lady and all the past first ladies. And then there's a picture that was taken just five years ago at the Bush Library with the current first ladies. And to see her as the moment in the middle between the shifting of one world to another in a sense and the way we saw our political leaders and the way they evolved and changed and how she she straddled both worlds. She was the end of the old world of politician and how we saw it, and she was part of the new generation too. And I think that that bridge will always be connected with that presidency and with her as a first lady. And so I think that'll be one thing people will look at is how during their simple four years that shift started to happen and how the world looked at politicians differently. Initially, that's my reaction. What would you say? Well, that's that's a very good point. Uh, you know, a lot. Of, let me just point this out. A lot of people think the Bushes had it made. Oh, they come from you know background that they never have to worry about anything. That is not so. They had a they had a very tough road to hoe in the political world. Mm -hmm. Let me just cite for you. And I know I was there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they they were written off many times. Let's go back. Now, okay, he finally he ran for the Senate. The first race ever he ran in was in 1964 for the United States Senate, and he had to run a primary against other Republicans, and then he got defeated in the Senate race by Ralph Yarbrough. Mm -hmm. It was when Johnson was president and Texas was a Democrat state. So he lost that race. People said, oh, that's the end of George Bush. Well, two years later, he comes back in 1966. They created the 7th Congressional District here. He ran for that, and he won. Uh, so he served two terms. And then in 1970, he ran for the Senate again ended up this time against Lloyd Benson. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought he was going to win that race, and guess what? He didn't. In fact, I remember on election night when it was time to go down and, you know, make the announcement that we were conceding it. Somebody said, Pete, go tell him. I said, why me? <laughs> so I go over, he was kind of slumped in a couch, and I went over to him. I said, I think it's that time. I said, how are you? And he said, well, I feel like it's 12 minutes past 84. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know, but that's how I feel right now. <laughs> but anyway, the, okay, so he lost that Senate race. All the media, the pundits, everybody said, that is the end of Bush now. He's lost twice for the Senate, and you don't bounce back from that. Well, what happened? Nixon named him U.S. Ambassador of the United Nations. Totally different experience. Mm -hmm. And he loved it. It's when China came into the U.N. It was fascinating. I was there. It was a fascinating two years there. Well, then what happens? Nixon names him chairman of the Republican National Committee during Watergate. And everybody said, that is the end of George Bush. <laughs> Nobody would want that job. Well, he did it, and he did it with honor. He held yep. his, kept his head hell high and managed to keep the glue on the Republican Party at the time. Well, what then President Ford comes into office. He'd become fascinated, fascinated at the U.N. with China, so the Bushes go to China, where he's chief of the U.S. liaison office. All the pundits said, that's the end of him politically. He's in China. Nobody cares about him anymore. Then he comes back to do what? To be director of the CIA. Yeah. And they said, that is the last job. You, you go to CIA, you're never in politics exactly. again. You disappear. And the, so he, I, I can tell you at the time, he was totally written off by the media. By, I had heard so that during all of that. And so anybody that says it was easy for him, it wasn't. I heard during all of that when he would get these appointments that would take him out of possibly a, a future in politics, Barb was there and was very, she would worry more than he would. She would be more concerned. She would, I don't want to say lose sleep over it, but she was the one who got more riled up about it. He would take it smoother and she would be the fighter. But then she would come around to being totally supportive of it once the decision was made and get right in step and okay, yeah. now we're going to do this, let's go do it. But my point is, if you were going to write a script on how to run for president or get elected to president, <laughs> this isn't the way to do that it. would be the exact <laughs> opposite. So when I hear people saying, oh, the Bushes had it made, uh-uh. Yeah. They, they worked hard 
to get where they were. And then just to finish it all off, he came back here uh, after, after that and ran for president and ended up losing mm -hmm. to President Reagan. A lot of people forget this. Right. And uh, I'll never forget uh, uh, the convention that year in 1980 was in Detroit. And after he withdrew from the race, um, he called me up one day and my father had just passed away. And he said, look, I don't know what's going to happen at the convention. It's in Reagan's hands in terms of the vice presidency right. now. And he said, we have no role other than just be there. He said, so why don't you come, come on up there and be at the, which was very caring of, it's so typical of the Bushes. They cared about, they were worried about me because my father had just passed away. So I went there and we just basically sat around for two days. And then one night, totally unexpectedly, Reagan went to the convention hall on an impromptu basis and said, I'm naming George Bush as my vice president. Wow. I do want to ask another question because you bring up the Reagans there. And there was a lot of, I remember back at the time, concern about Nancy and Barbara and that they would butt heads. What was the real relationship like with the two of them? You knew the Reagans very well. You knew the Bushes extremely well. The, I, I never saw, if they ever did butt heads, which I don't believe they did, I never saw that. In the Bushes, you never heard anything but the most supportive statements about the Reagans. Mm -hmm. about, th th those stories came from other people, from, right. from sources, and people didn't know what they were talking about. People love to create a good cat fight oh, even when sure. there's not one there. But you know something? Those who know don't, don't talk, you know, that right. story doesn't get out. <laughs> yeah. There is uh, also, I want to remind everyone, we were talking about legacy too, and one that I forgot to mention, I think one of the strongest legacies of Barbara Bush will be her literacy work. Absolutely. And that the lives that it's already touched have, uh, the work she has done has touched lives where it will be felt for generations to come. Once, as she often said, if you can read and write, it solves so many of the problems. It gives you much more equal footing in the world. And I think that and all the money they've raised, even as much as last night, will continue to help with literacy. And she worked in literacy programs in all 50 states. So it wasn't just here in Houston. It wasn't just Texas. And that will make a big impact, I think. No question. I mean, her legacy will go on forever, basically, in terms of all the charities, literacy. I mean, uh, what she, she has dedicated to all these. On the, on the legacy thing, I, I kind of sum it up in three, three parts, and I've already mentioned the first one, which was she cared. She mm -hmm. truly cared about people. And again, I want to emphasize people from all, underline and exclamation part, point, all walks of life. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is what you just cited, Ernie, her mm -hmm. devoted commitment to literacy, uh, to all charities. Um, and, 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 and lastly, for me, her legacy is her great sense of humor. Yeah. I, 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 I will miss that tremendously. Well, just, things, just sometimes when I was down or something, you'd be around her and she'd say something and you'd go, that is so witty. One of the things I did the other day was I looked for Barbara Bush quotes and there was some blog up there that had all the, the witticisms and stuff and it was just fun to read back through them. I see Aurora over here again. Two questions. And we're running out of time here, so if you've got a question or I comment, I will also get them in miss now. hearing her say to other people, no, no, dearie. No, no, dearie. That, that dearie was, <laughs> to me, that was a trademark of hers. Okay, uh, Peter, Carla wants to know, did Barbara's influence lead to a specific policy in George H. Bush's presidency? Yeah, did you ever see her push for something that... Only she and he would know the answer to that, but... Uh, uh, she she was not shy about talking to him about, about issues. Now, can I say that she impacted his decision on something? I don't know. Yeah, I would, that was between the two of them. I I would go both ways on it. One she is would, that she, she was would so keep her supportive views, uh, from a public arena. Right. She had a point of view, and she was proud of her points of view, but she also was extremely supportive, and it was a, a very interesting combination within her. So we'll never probably know the full. The full impact she some may Some historian, have had. maybe someday. We'll leave it. That's what he said, why he never wrote his, his book. I mean, he's had several books, but they're more quotes books and right. things like that. And he said, I'm not, I'm not going to write my memoir. Let, let, I'm going to leave it Let to the historians. Yeah. She also journaled quite a bit. She kept Diaries. detailed notes and all of that. They both did. Yeah, so those are interesting Which to Which is have. great, and that'll be great for history. And it was the basis of her book that she put out, too, was her journals from there. Uh, Aurora. Following up, Carla also asks, as someone who was so polite, how did Barbara feel about our current president? 
Peter, I'll leave that for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use an old pre press secretary line. I have nothing for you on that. <laughs> and I think I'll just leave that there. Um, I would think that the biggest challenge would be the shift in the way we conduct ourselves in, in the political arena today from in the time when they were very active players. And I would think to anybody who grew up with that kind of respect and manners and proper ability, it must be difficult to watch where we are right now. I, w I would just point out, if you go back, go look at all the presidents since the Bushes, you would be hard pressed. In fact, I'd say you couldn't find it anywhere where they were critical of a current president. Yeah. First Lady, uh, they were they were they just did not choose to do that, and I admire them for that. And I would I would also add to it, but their sense of hope and optimism and belief in us as a country and as a people would lead them, I would think, to think that it will always be better in America. We can always do better. They Is that were, safe they to were, say? They were great optimists yeah. about this country. Yeah. Car oh, I was going to say I was going to call you Carla. She's asked so many questions. Aurora, yeah. two questions for Peter. What's the best advice Barbara Bush gave you, and what was one of Mrs. Bush's best jokes? Well, I've told, I think I've run through my repertoire of jokes, <laughs> uh, but you know when you start going back through your own files and notes and stuff, you come across so many of those little mm -hmm. moments that I, I, I know I've got things. Bar said this and such today that made me laugh. Um, best advice, both of them. It's, you know, to me, good advice is so simple. I mean, it's advice, sound advice is not complicated. And they were, they, get, they gave you basic, the, the advice they gave you for me was by watching them, yeah. how they conducted themselves with other people. And I would see them do a certain, I think, boy, I hope I, that's the way I would do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, to me, that's leadership. That's quiet leadership. Yeah. Um, they both would often say, in the end, when you had a tough decision, do the right thing. Yeah. It's pretty basic. Do the right thing. And it might not have time, sometimes been the easy decision or the political decision, mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, it was the right thing to do. They followed their moral compass. Always. Yes, which had been instilled in them by their parents. Right. And they passed it on to their, their kids and their family. And I, and I was the beneficiary in a kind of sidebar way of, of that because I heard my parents talking through them. Yeah. I'll tell you, I don't know that I should share this story, but I will. It's one of my favorite Mrs. Bush stories. And it was the fact that we did a show, an after show for Downton Abbey. Mrs. Bush was a huge fan of Downton Abbey. We've actually posted an interview we did on our show, Manner of Speaking with her, that's on the website, so you can look around for that. But... She had been watching a season of our show, and in the summer, she sent a note through her secretary to our development office saying, you know, Mrs. Bush has noticed that Ernie's guests following each episode are frighteningly on point. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but so obviously Ernie must know what's happening on the shows before they air, which has led Mrs. Bush to believe Ernie sees the shows ahead of time. And if, in fact, he's seeing the shows ahead of time, how can Mrs. Bush see them ahead of time? <laughs> so the note was passed to me, and I thought, oh, what do I do? It's the former first lady. I guess I got to give it up. So Downton Abbey aired earlier in the UK than it did here. I would get copies that maybe weren't the most uh, legal. Uh, I guess that's not even the right word. The most uh, protected and uh, commercially released copies of the show. And I would see the show, and that's how we could book and plan our show ahead. So I decided, all right. So I corresponded with Mrs. Bush, and I was like, I, I can share these with you, but you can't tell anyone. I'm thinking, she can probably keep a secret. She was the first lady. So I sent them out. That night, I'm watching a show on TV, and it's about the Secret Service. And the Secret Service, one of their territories, is counterfeit. And that's one of the things that they watch over and they prosecute against. And I'm like, oh, God. Former first ladies, former presidents, their mail is looked at by the Secret Service before it gets to them. So the next morning, I get into my office, I send an email to Mrs. Bush's secretary, and I was like, oh, my, I, I can't sleep at all. I'm so worried. I have just sent what are basically bootleg copies of this show to Mrs. Bush, 
and the Secret Service is going to see them, and I'm going to get in trouble. And the note came back to me, oh, trust us, Ernie, Mrs. Bush knows how to get her mail before the Secret Service gets to it. <laughs> so she knew to pull the stuff before it went through Secret Service, and I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> but I just thought, you know, there's a woman, she knows what she's doing. She's on top of it. And uh, yeah. it, it built a wonderful friendship between us that I, I miss today. And that's great that you had that friendship. Yeah. You know, you just reminded me, uh, here's a little anecdote that nobody's familiar with. Um, after President Carter, or then Governor Carter, was elected president in um, 19, what was that, 1988? Um, well, it came inaugural day. Okay, you have a time between November and January, transition period where new presidents are getting ready to mm -hmm. come into the White House, and all the previous administration is out, including all of us at that point. So that would have been, uh, I'm sorry, 1976, okay. Ford versus Carter. So we were all getting ready to go back, come back to Houston. Uh, 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 George Bush, who was then CIA director, Jim Baker had run President Ford's campaign, me, all of us that were from Houston. So one day she called up and said, uh, we're packing up one of those 30 moves, she said, and uh, we're packing, I'm packing up, and would you, and I thought this was so thoughtful, her, she would you like to put some of your stuff in our moving truck or whatever they were? I thought, you know, she didn't have to do that, and yet she's thinking about somebody else mm -hmm. other than them. Well, I said, well, that's so thoughtful, Barr. I really appreciate it. And she said, well, why don't you come on over? We're going to watch the inaugural today. It was inaugural day. So I went over to their house there in Washington, and we were all just sitting there watching the, watching the um, inaugural. And then after the speech was over, like all pr incoming presidents, they go down Pennsylvania Avenue, drive down Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, into that drive down Pennsylvania, at one point, uh, President Carter and his wife got out of the car and mm -hmm. started walking. Right. And I remember Barbara Bush sitting there. She said, that is such a neat thing for them to do. And little did we realize when we were sitting there, and she was sitting there, that 11 years later, she and her husband would do the exact same, same thing. thing. And the day they did that, I often wondered, I thought, who says history doesn't repeat itself? Yeah. Uh, Did they aspire to be president? Was there a desire to get to that point, or was it just service after service to the next position they could do work? Well, I certainly think the the service aspect, no question, came into play. Um, I will point out that even when he was elected congressman, speculation started then about his future mm -hmm. and the possibility that one day he was just seen as a comer from day one when he was in Congress. And I remember at the 1968 Republican National Convention after Nixon got the nomination, uh, and mind you, Bush is just a first time congressman at that point, it finally boiled down to about four names and the speculation of who he was gonna, Nixon was gonna take as his vice president. And guess who was one of those four? It was George H.W. Bush, congressman from Texas. Wow. Now, it didn't happen, but I thought, wow. That, that they're already thinking of him in those terms meant he had earned respect at the highest levels in Washington. And from that point on, any time each presidential election or something about, number of times his name came up in vice presidential speculation every time the VP slot was open. And I'll just tell you one, I don't, I don't know if we have time here or not, but uh, in 19, after Ford took office, after Nixon resigned uh, in 1974, the speculation quickly narrowed down to two people at that time, Nelson Rockefeller, who had been governor of New York, and George Bush, who at that time was chairman of the Republican National Committee, not exactly the best stepping stone to be right. considered for vice president. Well, it just it went on for days, and the speculation was running rampant in Washington. Bush finally said, let's go, to, let's go up to Kennedy Barport and get away from all this, because there's nothing we can do about it. Right. We go up there, finally the day comes, we're sitting out on the porch at the house they lived, used to live in, and he, he says, watch this little TV, and the guy comes, or President Ford came on and announced that he'd taken Rockefeller. There was one TV crew there from Portland Main Station, and she came up to him and stuck a mic in front of him and said, Mr. Bush, you don't, outwardly, you don't seem to be so too upset about this. He looked at her and he said, yes, but you can't see what's inside of me. Yeah. And I never forgot that, which was saying, we're human just like everybody else. Yeah, and like human like everybody else, the time came to an end and we've lost Mrs. Bush, but I think it's hard to say it in Like that I term. said at the start, you've told me that, but I don't have to believe right. it if I don't want to. Yeah, 
I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and memories with us today. And I know it's a difficult time for you, and you've got a, a, a heavy time ahead to this weekend. And so thank you for taking the time to chat with us thank, about thank it. Thank you, Ernie, for giving me the chance to talk about Barbara Bush as I knew her. Yeah. And I will remind all of you, we are going to, on our website, on the Houston Public Media Facebook page, and on our website, we're going to be streaming live the uh, visitation that's going to be going on for all of today. It starts at noon and goes till midnight. You'll be able to watch that. And tomorrow, we'll be streaming also the funeral. And if you go to News 88.7, we'll be commenting on that tomorrow, starting at 11 a.m. on News 88.7, as we remember a great First Lady, our former First Lady, both a First Lady and the mother of a President a very rare thing to happen in any individual. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. I'm Ernie Manus at Houston Public Media with Peter Russell. Thank you very much again. Thank Peter. you, Ernie. A pleasure.